From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. U.S. President Donald Trump continues to face outrage over his policy of separating immigrant children from their parents at the U.S.-Mexico border. Protests have been growing in the U.S. as well as worldwide against Trump's zero-tolerance policy towards immigrants. Protesters from Texas, New York and Philadelphia took to the streets to voice their concerns about the mistreatment of innocent children by the administration. Nationwide protests against the forced separations are planned for June 30. I just, I, I just, every time I think this administration isn't going to sink any lower, it does. And, and this is one of those things that hits home. I have two young kids. Um, I heard those, those videos and I saw those photos and I just imagined my own children being ripped away from me. Enraged human rights activists in Washington confronted the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen who chose a Mexican restaurant to have dinner on the day videos and audio of detained Central American children were released. Mexican citizens and politicians have strongly condemned the situation at the U.S.-Mexico border. Our correspondent in Mexico City, Pablo Perez, has more. It's with general outrage that the, Mex the Mexican people has responded to the news, the videos and the audios of the uh, kids being taken apart from their families at the Mexican-U.S. border. The three um, uh, candidates for the presidency, the, all of them have uh, questioned this politics by the uh, Trump administration and even the Mexican Chancellor Luis Videgaray has, uh, has uh, declared this, those measures like inhumane and cruel as inhumane and cruel but the rest of the, uh, of the other parties, the opposition parties have said that those uh, measures that, uh, that uh, the Chancellor asked from the US government are mild, were not enough for the level of the humanitarian crisis that it's, uh, is happening right now in, at the border. Pablo Perez from Mexico City. And as he talked about the Mexican Foreign Minister Luis Videgaray, he also issued a statement saying he considers the events unfolding at the border utterly cruel and inhumane. The government of Mexico the government of Mexico makes a call to the international community to speak out on this situation, which is unacceptable. We call on the government of the United States to allow and facilitate daily communication between parents and children. We know of many cases in which parents simply cannot speak to their children, and of course, very painful cases in which children are not allowed to communicate with their parents. Reactions have been pouring in from El Salvador, where many of the migrant children began their journey to escape violence and instability. It's unacceptable because it hurts, not just the people involved through a violent aggression, but harms human dignity, the most essential thing we have. It's an action by the U.S. government and Donald Trump that hurts everyone's dignity. It's a crime against humanity that violates the respect of the integrity of the families. We spoke with Dr. Evelyn Encalada Gres, a migrant rights activist, about her reaction on the recently released video and audio of the separated children. Overall, I just saw um, this uh, state violence that has had many faces throughout many decades throughout um, the region um, with our relationship to um, the United States and the way that also the problems that people are fleeing from children their mothers and their fathers from Central America and as far as also Brazil um, are a lot of them are US made problems with the United States interfering in Latin America for for several decades and aborting many social reforms um, that people are just having to escape from right now. The United States officially withdrew from the United Nations Human Rights Council on Tuesday. 
accusing the council of being biased, hypocritical, and self-serving. That exit marks the latest U.S. departure from multinational organizations and treaties. The country has pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, the UN Global Compact on Migration, the UN Culture and Education Body, UNESCO, as well as the Iran nuclear deal. For too long, the Human Rights Council has been a protector of human rights abusers and a cesspool of political bias. Regrettably, it is now clear that our call for reform was not heeded. Human rights abusers continue to serve on and be elected to the Council. The 47-member Human Rights Council has played an important role in resolving critical human rights issues in North Korea, Syria, Myanmar and South Sudan. After the withdrawal, the United Nations said it regrets to move. It also said they are disappointed but not surprised. June 20th marks the World Refugee Day. Currently, over 68 million people across the world have been forcibly displaced by conflicts or internal persecution. According to figures of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, a person was displaced every two seconds in 2017. The conflicts in South Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo and the exodus of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar brought the total number of forced displacements to a record of 68.5 million people. Violence in Central America has boosted the number of refugees from that region 16 times since 2011. The UN highlights that 85% of refugees come from developing countries. This figure that dismantles the idea that the refugee crisis has affected mostly the countries in the global north. Violence flared again in Nicaragua on Tuesday after the opposition suspended its participation in talks with the government. Armed opposition groups manned barricades in the city of Masaya and fired homemade weapons as the security forces and government supporters tried to break the siege of a police station. Bursts of gunfire resounded in three central neighborhoods and there were reports of several people killed. The national dialogue remains suspended as opposition groups demand that President Daniel Ortega invites the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and the European Union to oversee the talks. Official numbers have been released by the Truth, Justice and Peace Commission detailing 173 deaths which have occurred since the beginning of the anti-government protests on April 18. The Truth, Justice and Peace Commission condemned the violence as different sectors of society urged the parties to get back to the dialogue table. We, as a student movement, are convinced that the dialogue is the only way towards peace. Yesterday, we could not advance, it is unfortunate. All Nicaraguans are very united so that we can find a solution. Nicaraguans are very concerned. No one feels protected in their own home. Nicaragua's Minister for Domestic Policies has been talking to Democracy Now! about the unprecedented opposition violence in his country and the grave bias in international reporting about the situation. Nicaragua is a polarized society. And there's been violence in the last two months on both sides. And what we've seen lately is a, is a wave of violence never seen before in Nicaragua, of kidnappings, of state institutions destroyed, mayor's offices burned down, torture, intimidation, persecution. And uh, there's been a tremendous slant in the news because this is a media war also. And it's a social media war. It's straight out of Gene Sharp's handbook of how to destabilize governments that's been used several times. And I'm not the only one saying this. Gene Sharp's handbook has been recommended by leaders of this movement. You can find that on the, um, on the, on the internet. And uh, false news, black propaganda is part of the game. And there's no balance in this. It's all one-sided. So the... We also spoke with U.S. journalist Max Blumenthal, who recently published an in-depth look at U.S. interference in Nicaragua, particularly regarding a recent meeting between Nicaraguan student opposition leaders and right-wing neoconservative figures in Washington.
Well, four uh, student leaders from Managua were brought to Washington by Freedom House, which is actually an arm of the U.S. government that traditionally aligns with neoconservative interests. It supported uh, war and regime change in Iran, for example, and around the world has advanced regime change. And it bankrolled the student's trip. Uh, to Washington to meet with the head of USAID, which is an arm of the State Department, which has committed millions of dollars into funding regime change against socialist-oriented governments, including the government of Nicaragua and Venezuela, as well as Cuba. Uh, they also met with three of the most right-wing, hawkish uh, members of Congress, Ileana ross Leighton in the House and Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz in the Senate, and posed for photographs. And this really revealed uh, what the agenda of these students is and how closely controlled it is by what. We'll take a short break now, but join us again after this video from our multimedia team. Welcome back. In Venezuela, Diosdado Cabello has been elected as the new president of the National Constituent Assembly. Cabello is replacing Delcy Rodriguez, who is now executive vice president, elected unanimously. Hundreds of people came to see the appointment of Cabello as the new president of the National Constituent Assembly as the session was shown on television and as well on giant screens outside the building. Y pido. I ask with all modesty for your support to succeed in this new role and to allow this National Constituent Assembly to fulfill the expectations of our people. The Constituent Assembly needs to rise to the expectations of our people. The Supreme Court in Brazil absolved Senator and President of the Workers' Party, Glacey Hoffman, on charges of alleged corruption. The five Supreme Court members unanimously dismissed the accusations that linked Hoffman to the scandals regarding the state-owned oil company Petrobras. Prosecutors accused Hoffman and her husband of receiving around $568,000 for a campaign slash fund. The head of the Workers' Party always defended her innocence and said the process was part of a political persecution. Colombia's president-elect Ivan Duque said that he would demand the National Liberation Army, or ELN, to cease all of its activities to continue with the peace talks. The upcoming president also said he wants the peace accord signed with the FARC in 2016 to be modified, but he promised he will not erase the agreement. During his electoral campaign, Duque said that former guerrilla members should go to jail despite any agreement. 
The ELN and the Colombian government are currently holding peace talks in Havana, Cuba. The only way to build a process of peace that gives Colombian people confidence must promote the suspension of all criminal activities. We have always said that we are not going to tear down the agreements of peace with the FARC. And what we have said is that the approach to modifications will be made on the basis of a peace that unites Colombia, because we can't remain divided as a country between friends and enemies of peace. Meanwhile, the Senate has postponed the vote on the bill for the special jurisdiction for peace requested by President-elect Ivan Duque. Following the Senate's decision, Juan Manuel Santos called for an extraordinary session in Congress to extend the debate until the Senate makes a move. The Special Jurisdiction for Peace is the mechanism of transitional justice created after the peace agreement to judge militants linked to the country's internal conflict. Members of the Democratic Center Party expressed their opinions regarding the call made by Pablo Beltran, chief negotiator of the ELN, to continue the dialogue with the government of Ivan Duque. We hope to continue our talks with the new government and for the peace agreements to be respected. We can't allow the ELN to do whatever they want as they sit at a negotiation table asking for even more things than the FARC did. For analysts, peace talks are in danger following Ivan Duque's election. Regardless of the peaceful intentions of the guerrilla group, this is terrible for peace. We're moving backwards, and what's worse is that they will throw away an entire process that took a lot of work and years to develop. The ELN is at its best point in terms of negotiations with the government. The newly elected president, as well as Alvaro Uribe supporters, have expressed a rejection of the peace agreements and the special jurisdiction for peace. We are against that jurisdiction. We consider it only useful for the FARC and criminal guerrillas, not for civilians and the national armed forces. Senators say that in spite of what the right-wing groups think, the jurisdiction should be enforced to defense peace. Eight million Colombians voted for continued peace. We will mobilize to protect and enforce the peace agreements. We think that this country must not go backwards after all the lives that have already been saved. Meanwhile, President Juan Manuel Santos stated that if the special jurisdiction for peace is not approved on Wednesday, he will call for an extraordinary session of Congress. Public outrage is growing against Mauricio Macri's agreement with the International Monetary Fund. The agreed measures are due to start this week. The agreement with the IMF made the social protests even worse. People arrived outside the central bank to express their rejection. They even burned flags of the United States empire. The increase of neoliberal policies applied by the government creates each time more hunger and misery among the people. There is total rejection for the agreement signed with the INF. The adjustment policies bring hunger to the people. We know that what's coming next is going to be terrible. This only means misery, hunger, the end of production, national industry and work. We lived in the 90s and now it's going to be worse. The $50 billion credit granted by the IMF comes during a serious economic crisis in the country and takes effect this week with the first advance of $15 billion. The agreement will follow a program that demands deep structural adjustments. The IMF is working along with the government to apply these kinds of policies. We are now under the yoke of the international economic system and we are starting a process of the economic destruction of each country in the region. Economic uncertainty is having consequences in different provinces. Many are already bankrupt and can't pay workers' salaries. Our people are living in misery. Workers are poor now. Salaries are not enough to face inflation and unions are being abolished. We must keep fighting because we can't ask the government to reconsider things. The government is creating poverty. We can only keep on fighting. The IMF deals seem to be taking Argentina back to a crisis just like the one of 2001. People are not happy and workers are preparing a general strike for next Monday, the 25th of June. They hope it will take its toll on Mauricio Macri's government. 
In Paraguay, Hejitimiri indigenous people protested on Tuesday against an eviction from their lands located in the western department of Canindeyú. Demonstrators gathered outside of Congress in the capital city of Asunción. They wore chains around their necks to symbolize the oppression they say the community is suffering. The, the Hejitimiri were expelled from their lands where they have been living for decades by judicial orders. The Vatican envoys have finished their mission in Chile to investigate sexual abuse cases linked to the church. At their last press conference, Archbishop Charles Chicluna and Monsignor Jordi Bertomeu announced the creation of a reporting system to receive new accusations. They also made a call for justice to be served to the victims. During their week in Chile, Chicluna and Bertomeu met with victims of sexual abuse and with the Catholic community of Osorno, the most affected diocese by the sexual abuse scandals. The invitation to acknowledge and admit the complete truth with all of its painful repercussions and consequences is the starting point for an authentic healing process for the victim and also for the author of the abuse. In Panama, a bill in the National Assembly proposed by the public service authorities imposes a tax on users of solar panels. For economists and other analysts, this measure seeks to protect the interests of the companies that maintain the energy monopoly. The proposal under discussion appears to be catering to the interest of large corporations and companies that maintain this monopoly, according to some experts. Meanwhile, the government continues to permit the installation of dirty energy projects such as a thermoelectric plant in the sector of La Chorrera, which is being urgently built as a new source of energy. The government is only answering to the interests of the transnational groups that control the energy sector in the Panamanian market. A tax on solar panel users only blocks Panama signing of and upholding a worldwide resolution to promote sustainable development. At the World Cup in Russia, Portugal is winning 1-0 against Morocco. Striker Cristiano Ronaldo scored the first goal of the match in the fifth minute. Later today, Uruguay will face Saudi Arabia in St. Petersburg and Spain will try to obtain its first victory against Iran. We'll take one last short break, but join us again after another video from our multimedia team. Thanks for joining us again. 
A French activism group piled up 348 life jackets for the same number of senators taking part in the immigration and asylum reform debated in the French Senate. Under the bill, undocumented immigrants could find their detention period doubled to 90 days. The number of people applying for asylum in France reached 100,000 last year. Now let's take a look at other stories making headlines around the world. More than 1,000 families in the north of Cameroon have received emergency aid from the Red Cross after fleeing the violence of the Islamic group Boko Haram. The international organization gave the displaced groups seeds and fertilizers to strengthen their autonomy. The families were also placed in host homes. Victims said they hoped to return home soon to cultivate their lands. The European Union Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker sharply criticized U.S. President Donald Trump, accusing him of meddling in German politics. Juncker's comments came a day after Trump tweeted that people of Germany were turning against their leadership because of loose immigration policies. Juncker added Trump may govern the United States, but not Europe. It is not the American president's job to speculate on whether the German population will be marching on the chancellery to replace Mrs. Angela Merkel. She won't be replaced by Mr. Trump. If she is replaced at all, which will not be desirable, it will be by German voters. Canada could become the first G7 country to legalize the use of recreational cannabis, as a bill was approved in Parliament earlier this week. The legislation must now pass the Senate and receive royal assent by the Governor General before becoming law, likely in September. The Senate could still delay its implementation, but not block it. And that's all for today's uh, stories on the Russia 2018 World Cup. But we have our special show, De La Mano del Diez, the World Cup, according to Maradona, that will air only on Telesur at these times, depending on where you are. So be sure to tune in. So we come to the end of this news brief, but as you know, this and other stories you can find on our website, telesurtv.net slash English. And be sure to follow us also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.